Welcome to a special 15-year anniversary episode of Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Sangeeta Bhatia, the John and Dorothy Wilson Professor of Electrical Engineering and Health Sciences Technology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the director of the Marble Center for Cancer Nanomedicine. Sangeeta leads a laboratory dedicated to leveraging nanotechnology to impact human health. She has pioneered technologies for interfacing living cells with synthetic systems, enabling new applications in tissue regeneration, stem cell differentiation, medical diagnostics, and drug delivery. Her multidisciplinary team has developed a broad range of inventions. Her group also develops nanoparticles and nanoporous materials that can be designed to study, diagnose, and treat a variety of diseases, including cancer. Sangeeta, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. To get things started, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you first got involved in nanotechnology? Well, first of all, thanks for hosting me today. This is a lot of fun to share our vision of nanotechnology with, with everyone. I am a physician and a biomedical engineer by training, so an MD, PhD, and I run a lab at MIT in the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. And generally what we do is use nanotechnology tools both for cancer and also for regenerative medicine applications. What are some of the most exciting projects that you've seen in your time there where you've leveraged nanotechnology to interface living and synthetic systems? Well, there, there's so many exciting projects. I, mean, I think just to give you sort of a, a little sense of history, you know, I was a, a graduate student in the 90s, so I'm sort of showing my age. But when I first started my lab, which was at UC San Diego around 1999, that was the moment kind of in technology development where we could start to make features on silicon that were sub 100 nanometer. It was sort of an interesting moment in time because when you cross kind of under that 100 nanometer length scale, it turns out there's all kinds of interesting biology that happens. And so as someone who's been trained as an engineer and a physician, I've been always kind of interested in that intersection of nanoscale physics and nanoscale biology and how they could come together to make medicines. So that's been incredibly exciting. And, you know, back in that time, um, the kinds of things that we were thinking about were how to use semiconductor crystals like quantum dots to do cancer imaging and try to hone them in on different tissues by coating them in different ways um, with peptide coating. And over the years, I think we have learned a lot as a community about how to get these teeny tiny materials into different tissues and different cell compartments of interest. If you sort of fast forward from then until now, my lab and then the Marble Center overall have been really excited about looking at areas of medicine where there are clearly grand challenges, let's say in cancer, like how can we detect cancer early when it's more treatable? Or in regenerative medicine, how can we make tissues repair themselves? Taking grand challenges like that and asking, you know, what piece of that does nanotechnology potentially have? The solution for. Some of the things that have come out of our center that we're really excited about are things like RNA and CRISPR delivery for drugging kind of undruggable targets in hard to treat cancers. Things like the invention of synthetic biomarkers, which are nanomaterials that go into the body and look for disease and then send out signals in body, body fluids. And then sort of next generation vaccines that could potentially prevent the development of cancer or intercept cancer. Diving a little deeper into that opportunity, as director of the Marble Center for Cancer and Nanomedicine, what are your thoughts on the long-term prospects of nanotechnology really playing a significant role in diagnostics and ultimately the treatment of cancer? Well, you know, I think honestly that we are teenagers <laughs> in our journey in the sense that we actually have some really great success stories already as a community of nanotechnologies that, you know, are in patients today in cancer and helping treat those cancers, things, for example, like Abraxane or like the Soma Boxerubicin. And, you know, now we're in this really interesting time period where we've had about 15 years of investment in the federal government to bring 
new people and ideas into the field. And you really have a really rich set of technologies that have been developed for all kinds of things, early detection, better therapies, better surgical guidance, harnessing the immune system and so on. And we're at a really interesting moment where we need to now convert some of those exciting inventions into the next generation of successful therapeutics for cancer. So I'm extremely excited about nanotechnology. The center that I run here has about 200 members, trainees and faculty in it. And um, it really stems from an early investment in the NIH's Center for Cancer and Nanotechnology Excellence. And, you know, what's really exciting is to just watch these trainees grow up in this really convergent environment, not even realizing that they are witnessing the convergence of different fields. But, you know, the talks could be physics one day and chemistry the next and molecular biology the third. And, you know, all they're thinking about is how these molecules and materials come together and how they can make them do what they want them to do. So I understand that when you were a graduate student, you started an outreach organization called Keys to Empowering Youth and that you now serve as an advisor to the Society of Women Engineers. What are your thoughts on, on education, outreach, and diversity in nanotechnology? I think for all of the grand challenges of our time, all of the big important problems, I think we can all agree that we want and need all the best minds that we have to offer. And because nanotechnology grew up from engineering and physics and mathematics, where women are largely underrepresented, um, and I think that's, you know, a shame. Um, and we need to work really hard to get more women to be part of the nanotechnology community and to develop them into leaders. So that's something that I work on at, at many levels, at the outreach level, as you as you mentioned, at the public outreach level, we try and talk to the public about what nanotechnology and nanomedicine are. We have a little mini golf game, actually, where the, the golf ball is like a nanoparticle and the obstacles are the different organs in the body. <laughs> yeah, our center director, Tarek Sadell, designed that. It's really amazing. And, you know, all kinds of demonstrations and interactive visits that the students can do here at the university. For the Society of Women Engineers, we try and talk about the culture of the profession that they're entering. We teach them how to advocate for themselves, how to advocate for each other, how to lead, how to raise capital if they're entrepreneurial. So really, at every level, we try to bring women into this discipline. Well, I want to pick up on that entrepreneurial thread you just laid down. So based on your experience launching companies, what do you see as some of the major roadblocks to the translation of nanotechnology discovery into applications? I think innovation can be tricky because much of what nanotechnology has to offer, certainly nanomedicines have to offer, are disruption, market disruption, a whole new way of doing something. And while that's exciting and important, it can also mean that the business models don't exist. The nomenclature may not exist. The regulatory path may not exist. The investment thesis may not exist. The reimbursement model may not exist. So you're doing something very new. One of the biggest roadblocks is to map yourself to the existing system um, and get people to take a chance on it. And by people, that means everything from investors to employees to regulators to clinicians. And, you know, of course, success breeds conversion. And we have some great examples of that now. But, but I think those are really the main challenges. Um, in our own startup, Glimpse Bio, which we spun out in 2015, which is a synthetic biomarker company. Many of the challenges that I described were the ones facing us. So right out of the gate, we were trying to raise money and people said, well, what are you? You know, you're an injectable nanomaterial with a urinary biomarker. Are you a drug? Are you a diagnostic? Who should regulate you? How should we invest in you? <laughs> what reimbursement code will be used to, for the patient? So the, all these unknowns become roadblocks. But I would say that the payoff and by payoff, I don't mean commercial payoff alone. I mean the impact, you know, is so potentially valuable that it's, it's really worth pushing through because 
these really are the market disruptions that we're going to look back on and pay attention to. Well, and I think that that just illustrates how pioneers like you really are laying the groundwork that will enable the adoption of new nanomedicines in the future or new uh, techniques and, and technologies. Do you have any advice for students who might be thinking of launching companies in this area? Well, you know, my advice for students about this area is to think about it a little bit like a research problem. And what I mean by that is, you know, when it's your research project, you have to at once have the vision for what you know the project could offer, but also be able to troubleshoot as you go and to be willing to listen and adapt, but not get dissuaded. And so it's this sort of delicate balance of being the visionary and being persistent and being focused but also be willing to be nimble and adaptive so that you can sort of place your vision in a larger landscape, you know, as it unfolds in front of you. And in some ways, that's, that's really just like research. You have sort of an idea of, you know, how the project you're doing is going to work out and why it might be important. But as the data comes and as the field unfolds before you, you, you change and you adapt and you might ask a slightly different question or generate a different hypothesis. And so, you know, it's a, it's a sort of a similar skill, but I think you have to have this sort of paradox of being the visionary and the problem solver at the same time. Well, I think that's great advice for students who might be thinking of launching a company or just for life in general, being a visionary, <laughs> persistent, you know, looking to ask for help when you need it and be nimble or adapt as necessary. I think because nanotechnology is in many cases a new area for a clinician or for an investor or for whoever your audience is, you will get a lot of advice to change your idea, <laughs> to change your idea, change what you have to offer, to make it fit a model that people feel comfortable with. And what I would say is if you really know where your technology could be disruptive and provide the most benefit, I would hold tight to that vision. And in the case of Glenn's Bio, the synthetic biomarker company, I got told a lot that it would be much more investable if we were a cancer therapy company. And while it is true that we were delivering nanomaterials and we could fill the core with therapeutics, that wasn't what the technology was about. And so, you know, we listened very politely, but then just kept on going. Right. And having the confidence to keep it moving. That's great. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the NNI. As you know, we're celebrating the 15-year anniversary of the signing of the 21st Century Nanotechnology Research and Development Act. From your perspective, where do you think nanotechnology has had the most significant impact in the past 15 years? Yeah, that's a great question. I think probably two main areas. You know, and it's interesting. So nanotechnology is small, <laughs> obviously, um, and it means that sometimes people don't think about it in their daily lives, but it's really pervasive. It's a silent hero in, in so many of our technologies, but and, you know, an obvious ubiquitous one is our smartphones. Obviously, the fact that we can use nanotechnology to make microelectronics the way we make them has been changed all of our lives. In medicine, I would say, you know, it's been really exciting to see a whole new class of therapies come in RNA delivery. And those are nano-enabled medicines. It's not just the nucleic acid that is the therapy. Sinkita, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to talk with us today. Do you have any closing thoughts that you would like to share with the listeners? I think in closing, I would just encourage people to think about the so-called tiny technologies, you know, and what happens when you have materials that are a thousand times smaller than the width of a human hair and recognize and read about the fact that we know that the physics of these materials changes at that length scale and the biology of these materials changes. So just to sort of have people dream a little bit about what happens when things are that small or what could happen. Thank you for joining us today for this special 15-year anniversary edition of Stories from the NNI. 
If you would like to learn more about nanotechnology, please visit nano.gov or email us at info at nnco.nano.gov and check back here for more stories. <laughs>